on World News Tonight. COVID chaos. Hospitals overwhelmed and the world is at risk of having a shortage of medical supplies. Has China taken the right step by easing restrictions? Biting back. Putin has delivered Russia's long-awaited response to a Western price cap, signing off a ban on oil sales. Do not drive. The U.S. digs out from deadly blizzard, forcing the state military to impose a driving ban. And a tasty tour. Gingerbread village maker unveils his latest creation in New York City. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News tonight. Now, as we thought the COVID pandemic was coming to an end, fears are now on the rise again. As deadly infection numbers in China are reaching unprecedented levels. Despite that, China rolled back COVID-19 restrictions for the first time since the pandemic began. The latest decision continues China's loosening of its strict zero COVID policies following a wave of anti-lockdown protests. That loosening, though, has led to skyrocketing infection rates with both hospitals and crematoriums overwhelmed. Tonight, China's hospitals under strain as a wave of COVID sweeps the country, with harsh lockdowns no longer in place to hold it back. Emergency room patients, many on oxygen, filling every available bed, and in some cases, spilling out into the hallways. Work in the emergency department is non-stop, this doctor says. And here, medical staff warn families there's no oxygen for patients in the corridors. The exact scale of the surge, unknown. China this week stopped publishing daily COVID data. But experts say it appears to be tearing through a population without herd immunity, and where many, including the elderly, have not received boosters. China began scaling back its zero COVID restrictions after widespread anti lockdown down protests. Some demonstrators even calling for the downfall of the Communist Party. The government's official explanation for the change, Omicron is less likely to cause hospitalization and death, and so doesn't require severe restrictions. Here in, you know, in the United States and really for most countries around the world, we have this large pool of relative immunity that's built up based on prior infections. But in China, we just don't know that for certain because we really don't know exactly how a population that doesn't have a large pool of prior infection is going to react to Omicron infection. The latest move, starting January 8th, travelers arriving in China will no longer need to quarantine, ending a requirement that's been in place since early 2020. Right now, travelers face eight days of quarantine, but at times it's been as long as three weeks. For many ordinary people, relief at the reopening mixed with fear of resurgent COVID. I'm definitely a little worried, but for the sake of living, you have to be able to work normally, right? Harsh restrictions, hopefully soon, a thing of the past. But a long winter struggle with the virus may still be ahead. While China's decision to end its zero-COVID policy may cause a boost to the global economy, the unprecedented surge in infections could have other unintended consequences, such as a shortage of medical supplies. With over a billion inhabitants, China putting a sudden end to its zero-COVID policy has opened a can of worms and left experts wondering how the rest of the world might be impacted. But with the virus having largely circulated around Europe, Epidemiologists say the risk of serious health repercussions on the continent is limited. We have high vaccination rates with very efficient vaccines that cover 70, 80, even up to 90 percent of the populations. And unlike China, we've also let the virus circulate. So we have a strong immunity and vaccination shield. But one question remains, whether the availability of pharmaceutical drugs may become an issue. 80% are produced in China or India, and shortages could be just around the corner. The epidemic will lead to a decrease in work capacity, particularly in factories where medicines are produced. So a decrease in production, and we've seen it before where Chinese authorities mobilize some of the stock for their own population before exporting it. Market demands for antigen reagents and fever-reducing medicines have skyrocketed across China and pharmaceutical companies are working at full steam to ensure supply. 
Our current production output has doubled compared with 20 days ago. But for the time being, pressure on drugs like paracetamol and ibuprofen is set to continue as demand in Europe remains high, but imports are slowing. Now on the unending crisis in Russia and Ukraine, Russian President Vladimir Putin has issued a decree that bans oil sales to countries and companies that comply with a price cap agreed by the Western countries in response to Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. Moscow has, however, given its long-awaited response to the price cap. It banned the supply of crude oil and oil products from February 1st for five months to nations that abide by the cap. Russian President Vladimir Putin has signed an order banning the export of oil and crude oil products to countries that have imposed price caps. It's the long-awaited response to the ceiling of $60 per barrel applied by Western countries on Russian oil. Putin says the ban will come into effect on the 1st of February and will last for five months, although the decree includes a clause that allows him to overrule it in special cases. The price cap on seaborne oil from Russia was agreed to by the European Union, the G7 and Australia earlier this month because of Moscow's war in Ukraine. It aims to diminish Russia's revenue and stabilize energy markets by allowing EU-based operators to ship the oil to third-party countries, provided it's priced below the cap price. European countries are already suffering from high energy prices due to the loss of a lot of Russian gas imports. It's not yet clear what impact Putin's decree will have on oil prices, but some analysts are suggesting it may prove to be largely symbolic. Now, Ukraine wants a peace summit by the end of February, preferably at the United Nations with Secretary General Antonio Guterres as mediator. Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba said that he was absolutely satisfied with the results of President Vladimir Zelensky's visit to the United States last week and that the White House plans to get a, a Patriot missile battery ready to be operational in the country in under six months. Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba says that his government wants a peace summit at the end of February when the war in Ukraine is expected to enter its second year. Kuleba said in an interview with the Associated Press on Monday that Q wants a summit at the United Nations with Secretary General Antonio Guterres as a mediator. We think that the best the United Nations could be the best venue for holding this uh, this summit because this is not about making a favor to a certain country. This is really about bringing everyone on board. Kuleba added that Russia must face a war crimes tribunal before his country talks directly with Moscow. Meanwhile, Russia's defense ministry on Monday said a Ukrainian drone attack on an airbase in southwestern Russia has left three people dead. According to the ministry, falling debris from an aerial drone shot down by Russian air defenses killed three of its technical staff. Russia accused Ukraine of a similar attack on the airfield earlier this month. While the Ukrainian military did not officially admit to the latest attack, Yuri Inat, the spokesperson for the Ukrainian Air Force, said that the explosions at the base are the consequences of Russian aggression against Ukraine. Meanwhile, the Ukrainian Foreign Ministry on Monday shared a statement that called for Russia's exclusion from the Security Council of the United Nations and removal from being a member of the UN entirely. The Foreign Ministry alleged gross violations of the norms of international law and for crimes committed on the territory of Ukraine. The statement says Russia could be readmitted once it fulfills the conditions for membership. Now crossing over to the monstrous winter storm in the United States. Now state and military police were sent to keep people off Buffalo's snow-choked roads and officials kept counting fatalities three days after Western New Yorkers deadly storm in at least two generations. As residents of Western New York struggled to dig out from a deadly blizzard, officials have warned of a potential for a rapid melt with warmer temperatures later in the week. In Buffalo, upstate New York, there's so much snow that state and military police are ordering motorists to stay off the road. Some people have been trapped inside their cars after large amounts of snow fell in a short time period, killing dozens in the region. So I want people to understand there's a lot of roads that are completely blocked right now, that have no access whatsoever. And people are trying to drive into on these roads or trying to get into these neighborhoods and they can't. Please, 
please. You heard the mayor beg. I'm begging. Stay home. Authorities have cancelled more than 10,000 flights in just a few days. Southwest Airlines has been much more affected than other American companies by the historic winter storm gripping North America. Many are directing their ire over missed Christmas trips to the company. A huge swathe of the U.S. has been affected, from the Canadian border to here in Chicago, all the way down to Texas. More than 100 million people are battling freezing temperatures and disruption these last few days. Going into a short commercial break, we'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. The South Korean military publicly apologized for failing to shoot down North Korean drones that crossed the border. While expressing regret, the Joint Chiefs of Staff or the JCS devised plans to better counter such provocations. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff has offered a public apology for failing to shoot down the North Korean drones that crossed over into the South airspace on Monday. On Tuesday afternoon, Lieutenant General Kang shin Chur said the military acknowledges and regrets its limited capability to detect and shoot down small unmanned aerial vehicles that are 3 meters wide or smaller. The military has vowed to thoroughly check each unit's detection and strike assets and aggressively mobilize them for a stronger defense posture. Kang added that the military will come up with ways to shoot the vehicles without causing damage to civilians by carrying out air defense training and actively employ detection devices along with strike assets. To boost warfare capabilities, we will establish a drone unit to conduct surveillance and reconnaissance operations that will monitor the enemy's major military facilities. We'll also secure physical and non-physical attack assets along with stealth drones and operate them in an integrated way. Such remarks come in line with what President Yoon suk yeol had said during a cabinet meeting on Tuesday morning. Yoon vowed to ramp up South Korea's surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities using military drones by speeding up the establishment of a drone unit and deploying advanced stealth drones. Meanwhile, regarding the issue, the United States has reaffirmed its commitment to the defense of South Korea. According to the Voice of America, a White House National Security Council spokesperson said on Monday local time that the U.S. is aware of reports that five North Korean drones crossed the inter-Korean border, also known as the military demarcation line. The spokesperson added that Washington is in close consultation with South Korea on the nature of the incursion, recognizing the need for South Korea to protect its territorial integrity. It's said the State Department, too, has issued a similar response to the North Korean drone incursion. The Iranian president has called the anti-government protesters' opponents threatening that the Islamic Republic will deal with them with no mercy. Raisi also accused the exiled Muhajirini Kalk organization, which he refers to as hypocrites, as well as monarchists and all anti-revolutionary currents of being behind the current protests, which began in mid-September following the death of Masa Amini in police custody. There will be no pity for those who show hostility to the Islamic Republic. Those are the words of Iran's president, Ibrahim Raisi, as anti-government protests pass the 100-day mark. Speaking at an event for 400 soldiers killed during the Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s, Raisi blamed enemies of the nation for recent public anger. On Monday, the wife and daughter of Iranian football legend Ali Dai were reportedly prevented from leaving the country when their Dubai-bound flight was forced to land on an Iranian island. Dai, a former national team captain, has criticized the government for using repression to clamp down on protests. Nationwide rallies were sparked by the death of Masa Armini in September. She died in police custody after she was arrested for allegedly wearing her headscarf incorrectly. So far, the Iranian government has executed two people since protests erupted. Rights groups fear that there will be more. Protests in Peru after the ouster of former President Pedro Castillo have, been 22, have seen 22 people killed, the youngest 15. The deaths threatened to keep anger fired up despite a lull in violence over the festive period in the heavily Catholic country. 
Protests in Peru following the ouster of former President Pedro Castillo have left 22 people dead, the youngest just 15. And anger is simmering despite a lull in violence over the holidays in the heavily Catholic country. Edgar Prado, a mechanic and driver from southern Peru, was one of 10 people killed in the city of Ayacucho in the most bloody violence that has roiled Peru in recent weeks. Edgar's sister, Edith Prado, said he was not involved in the protests. He was basically murdered by the military. For us, this was a cruel attack on my brother. Edith said Edgar left the house he shares with her after gunfire hit their gate on December 15th, and he saw protesters being hurt. Just before 6 p.m., security camera footage shows a group of protesters and others standing in the street where a person lies on the sidewalk. Edgar is seen checking on the person while others run off. A minute later, Edgar is shot and collapses. He died the next morning. The military said they had come under attack and responded with force. The clashes began with the December 7th ouster of former President Pedro Castillo after he tried to illegally dissolve Congress to avoid an impeachment vote he feared losing. Parliament voted him out of office and he was arrested for alleged rebellion. Castillo denies the charges. His arrest triggered an outpouring of anger at the country's political elite and Congress, widely reviled as corrupt and self-serving, especially in Peru's poor southern regions. New President Dina Boularte tried to stem the protests, and the government declared a nationwide state of emergency December 14th, curtailing some civic rights and allowing the armed forces to support the police. 19-year-old Jonathan Alarcón died after he was shot in the hip during the protests, according to his aunt and data from Peru's ombudsman. In an act of protest, his family on December 22nd took his coffin to the plaza where he was shot, a red banner commemorating the victims of what it called a massacre. Jonathan's aunt, Luzmila Alarcón. The military is supposed to defend the territory or maybe confront another army in the jungle, but not to go out into the city where there are children and elderly and shoot the way they did. The United Nations has called for investigations into child casualties in the protests. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has condemned violence by both security forces and protesters and called for a dialogue. Tensions soared in northern Kosovo after unknown attackers exchanged gunfire with police and threw a stun grenade at European Union officers overnight. Hundreds of ethnic Serbs uh, outraged over the arrest of the former police officer gathered at roadblocks they erected the previous day, paralyzing traffic at two border crossings from Kosovo towards Serbia. A truck filled with rocks is barricading a road in the center of Mitrovica, an ethnically divided city in northern Kosovo. It's one of two new barriers blocking streets in the town, erected overnight by protesting ethnic Serbs. The latest flare-up in tensions was triggered by the arrest of a Serb former police officer earlier this month. Serbs living in the northern part of Albanian-majority Kosovo refused to recognize the Pristina government. Until now, they've only set up barricades on the main roads leading to the Kosovo-Serbia border. At a meeting with Serbian Patriarch Porfiria, Serbia's President Aleksandr Vucic said he expected the unrest to continue. He ordered the army to move to its highest state of alert, saying he believed Kosovo was preparing to attack Serbs and forcibly remove the barricades they've been setting up. Meanwhile, the Serbian Defense Minister has carried out an inspection of troops near the Kosovo border. And Pristina has asked NATO-led peacekeepers to remove previously established barricades, hinting that it might otherwise remove them by force. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The UN Security Council has denounced the bans on women and girls getting education or working for humanitarian aid groups in Afghanistan and called for the equal participation of women. The Council said the ban on women's education represents as increasing erosion for the respect of human rights and fundamental freedoms.
As China is set to reopen its borders for both inbound and outbound travel, Japan will require negative COVID-19 tests upon arrivals from travelers from mainland China. Cold wave conditions and dense fog continue to make lives difficult for people in northern India, the homeless being the worst hit. The U.S. Supreme Court says a Trump-era policy adopted at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic that has blocked thousands of people from crossing the U.S.-Mexico border will be kept in place as legal disputes play out. Heavy rainfall hit the ancient desert city of Petra in Jordan, causing severe flooding in the area. Tourists were evacuated from the site as water filled the gorge, turning it into a fast-flowing river. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other there in English. Now, an American crafter has made crafting gingerbread a way of life. We are leaving you tonight with his creative gingerbread village that consists of 700 houses and 4,000 pounds of candy. Stay safe and have a good night.